In this screencast, we will discuss Crohn's disease in a three-part series, this screencast being part one on active inflammation and stricture. I do want to give special thanks to some of my partners who assisted in preparing this PowerPoint presentation. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to classify the classic image findings of active inflammatory Crohn disease of the small bowel. When we think about how imaging impacts the management of Crohn disease, the first thing to realize is that endoscopy is really the gold standard for evaluation of the mucosa of the bowel. So whether that's upper endoscopy that can surveil the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, even parts of the small bowel, or colonoscopy looking at large bowel manifestations, Endoscopy is kind of the gold standard for mucosal inflammation, which we may not see subtle signs of on imaging. MR and CT enterography are going to be non-invasive tools, and they're going to really help provide a more complete picture of the degree and, and various manifestations of Crohn's disease. To properly communicate our image findings to impact management the way that we want it to be impacted, we need to have really standardized terminology. And because of this, uh, there were consensus guidelines published in 2018 that really tried to, to bring together a community of radiologists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, and start to standardize some of that terminology. When we look at what the consensus guidelines are, are how they're organized, there are kind of three different uh, basic categories. So small bowel inflammation, penetrating disease and mesenteric inflammation, and then extraintestinal findings. And you can find that paper uh, by the lead author David Bruning in Gastroenterology from 2018. It is an excellent overview and uh, well worth reading if you are doing imaging for Crohn's disease. So when we think about inflammation and stricture within the small bowel, we can see it manifest in a few different ways. So when we have inflammation of the small bowel, we may see uh, patterns of, of mural enhancement or hyperenhancement. We can see wall thickening. <clears throat> we can have strictures that develop. And then we can also have ulcerations. And we'll go through each one of these different manifestations uh, in this screencast. Let's start with patterns of enhancement. So classically, Crohn's disease affects segments of the bowel in uh, a discontinuous manner. So commonly, the terminal ileum or the distal ileum is involved, and you will have multiple segments of that terminal ileum or distal ileum involved with intervening segments of relatively normal bowel. When you're looking for a segment that's involved by active inflammation, there are a few different patterns that we can see. So we can certainly see <clears throat> asymmetric enhancement. So instead of seeing abnormal enhancement circumferentially around the bowel, there tends to be some selective hyperenhancement along the mesenteric border of an affected segment of bowel, and this may be early in the process. As that process progresses, you may see a stratified form of enhancement. And that stratified enhancement um, is now going to manifest in a targetoid appearance. Some people call it mural stratification. And what happens is, as, as that bowel gets more inflamed, you develop submucosal edema. And that submucosal edema causes the submucosa to be thickened and it also causes it to be low in attenuation, and it tends to enhance less than the inner wall of the bowel or the muscularis propria. So you get inner wall hyperenhancement, submucosal edema, then the muscularis propria, and that creates that targetoid appearance. In more chronic manifestations of Crohn's disease, sometimes that submucosal region or space can have fat deposition within it, and that can be an a manifestation of, of more chronic inflammation or prior inflammation. <clears throat> when you then progress on to a more chronic Crohn's disease, 
with what previously was referred to as fibrous stenosing disease, you may see a homogenous or very symmetric transmural enhancement. And when you get that transmural enhancement, you're now starting to think more of a late transmural enhancement that's associated with fibrosis. All right, so let's look at some classic examples of active inflammatory Crohn's disease. So here is a CT um, where we can see multiple loops of distal ilium. And these loops of distal ilium show wall thickening with inner wall hyperenhancement and a nice targetoid appearance or, or a stratified appearance. Looking at a correlate on MRI, we can see, again, the targetoid appearance of the bowel. And notice that the submucosa in this case is T2 hyperintense, indicating that submucosal edema. On post-contrast MRE imaging, we can also see in this case a very severe active inflammation, that robust inner wall hyperenhancement. Uh, in the past, that was called mucosal hyperenhancement, but we actually know that oftentimes in severe active inflammation, the mucosa is denuded. So instead of saying mucosal hyperenhancement, we now refer to it as inner wall hyperenhancement. When you think about wall thickening, there are a few different uh, sort of grades of wall thickening, so mild, moderate, and severe. And what you want to do when you're assessing wall thickening is you want to make sure that you have adequate distension of that particular loop of bowel with your oral contrast. And then you want to measure the most severe area of wall thickening in that area that's showing distension from oral contrast. We can see here some mild wall thickening, three to five millimeters, here nine millimeters, and then here, 13 millimeters. So just showing those different grades on MRI and CT. When you're looking for intramural edema on CT, it's going to manifest, again, as that low attenuation of the submucosa that results in wall thickening. On MRI or MRE, you're going to be looking for T2 hyperintense signal within the bowel wall uh, corresponding to the submucosa. So you see that T2 hyperintensity, and that can be on a T2 fat-saturated image or an image without fat saturation. And there is some thought that the greater the T2 hyperintensity, the more severe the inflammation. You can also see restricted diffusion. So there's been a lot of research on using restricted diffusion to try and grade the degree of inflammation. We can see here a region of active inflammation in the distal ileum. We can see on our high B value DWI imaging that there is high signal within the bowel wall corresponding to low signal on our ADC map. Once you've identified areas of active inflammation, you then want to start looking for areas of stricture. Stricture is best defined as luminal narrowing in an area of Crohn's disease. So that could be active inflammation or, or chronic inflammation. And, and that stricture typically manifests not just as luminal narrowing, but as luminal narrowing with upstream dilation. So if you do not see upstream dilation, we wouldn't necessarily classify that as a stricture. When you see upstream dilation, you're going to grade that dilation as mild or moderate to severe. And it's very important that when you find a stricture, you quite precisely characterize its location and its length. And that's because there may be need for surgical excision or small bowel resection of that strictured area of bowel. And it's very important for your clinicians to know how much bowel they're going to need to resect, how much bowel the patient will have after the resection, and which segments of bowel need to be resected. The last thing to think about is whether or not the stricture is the result of active inflammation, where you are seeing inner wall hyperenhancement, mural stratification, maybe some mesenteric edema, or if it's due to fibrosis. Fibrosis manifesting often as transmural delayed enhancement 
without that submucosal edema. Again, active inflammatory Crohn's disease with stricture. Here we're going to see uh, multiple different examples. So on CT, you can see this very short segment stricture characterized by these two blue arrows. We can see some interwall hyperenhancement with luminal narrowing. And, and proximally, there is not any upstream dilation. That's really a normal segment of bowel. So we can't definitely call this a stricture, although the, the patient certainly is at risk for stricture. In this next case on a T1 post-contrast image, we can see this longer segment of luminal narrowing. We see interwall hyperenhancement and some degree of mural stratification. And then we do have some mild upstream dilation. So we can char confidently characterize this as a stricture with mild upstream dilation. In this other patient, we can actually see multiple segments. So here's a segment of active inflammation. Here's a segment of active inflammation. Here's a segment of active inflammation. And there's probably one here moving out of the field of view. And in, in between these segments of active inflammation, we see areas of bowel wall that are normal in thickness, but are markedly dilated. So this would be considered multifocal stricturing with severe upstream dilation. And in this particular patient, it is going to be very important, again, to characterize where the stricturing is occurring, how long each of those strictures are, so that if a surgeon is going to have to resect bowel to relieve obstructive symptoms, they know how much bowel they're going to be taking and how much bowel they're going to be leaving behind. This again is just another example on CTE of a stricture with active inflammation. We see the inner wall hyper enhancement right? and the wall thickening, mural stratification, luminal narrowing, and then severe upstream dilation. We also see some severe downstream dilation, which likely indicates this another stricture. And, and in some cases, depending on the patient's symptoms, this certainly could manifest as a small bowel obstruction and may be considered a small bowel obstruction. Now, with active inflammation, often that small bowel obstruction will initially be managed medically because relieving some of that active inflammation may open up that lumen, relieve some of that luminal narrowing, and hopefully reduce some of those obstructive symptoms. But in some cases, medical management is not enough and they may need to go on to have a resection. Other manifestations of active inflammation include ulcerations. So ulcerations occur when there is sloughing of the mucosa and then erosions that may not necessarily be transmural or, or penetrating disease, but are sort of an early manifestation of that transmural inflammation that could eventually lead to penetrating disease. So you lose the mucosa you may see some focal areas of wall thinning superimposed on those areas of wall thickening that you see with active inflammation. And you may even see some areas where there is a small pit uh, within those areas of active inflammation. Ulcerations do tend to correlate with very severe disease and can be helpful to mention uh, when putting together your report as it helps the gastroenterologists or surgeons understand the severity of the disease. If we're going to characterize severe inflammation. Severe inflammation, we're going to see ulcerations. We are going to see marked T2 weighted signal hyperintensity, diffusion restriction, and severe bowel wall thickening. Sacculations may be related to acute or chronic inflammation. Um, they're, they're sort of a, a similar finding to an ulceration, um, but they tend to occur along the anti-mesenteric border and are uh, just another manifestation of 
severe or progressive Crohn's disease, and may be an early manifestation of penetrating disease, although that is not well understood. Another tool that we have in our toolbox when we're using MR enterography is Cine imaging. So we can do steady state pre precession Cine imaging of the bowel, and we can look for areas of diminished motility. So at times when you're doing CTE or MRE imaging, you may see a, an area of collapsed bowel that looks like it's luminal narrowing or looks like there's some wall thickening, but it could be that that is just a peristalsing segment of bowel that you captured in one moment of time. The Cine imaging allows us to capture the peristaltic activity of the bowel over time and can help us identify areas that are abnormal. In this particular example, you can see the white arrows pointing to multiple loops of jejunum showing normal peristaltic activity. And you can compare that to where the yellow arrows are pointing to the distal ilium in regions of active inflammation. Also note the mesenteric proliferation or fatty proliferation of the mesentery that's separating those loops of inflamed bowel. In summary, Active inflammatory Crohn's disease of the bowel should be classified based on the following features. The degree of wall thickening, the length and location of the stricture, and how much upstream dilation is resulting from that luminal narrowing or stricture. The degree of mural hyperenhancement and mural edema, and whether or not there are ulcerations or saculations. Thank you for your time. This is part one in a three-part series on Crohn's disease. I hope you join us for the other parts.